السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ود كثير من أهل الكتاب لو يردوكم من بعد إيمانكم كفارا حسدا من عنفسهم من بعد ما تبين لهم الحق فاعفوا واصفحوا حتى يأتي الله بأمر إن الله على كل شيء قدير صدق الله العظيم In our discourse last week in our sermon we spoke about a very very important duty which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has had to perform as commissioned by Allah and while I outline in the four different duties that Allah highlighted in the Holy Quran which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was ordered to perform he highlighted one important thing which was that of taskiyatun nufus or the purification of the soul and the purification of the heart in that verse we highlighted that there are certain things in the verse which sometimes a person can look towards as being sufficient in other words, a person as a Muslim may come and begin to learn the Holy Quran. He learns the Holy Quran. He may learn that which is in the Quran from knowledge. So he has ilm, he has knowledge. He may also learn the sunnah of the Prophet So he has ilm, he has learned knowledge. He has grasped the message and the meaning of the Holy Book. He recites it. He also has knowledge of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So three things he has, three. One is that he's able to recite the Quran, which is known as tilawat in Arabic. And about that, Allah considers that as the first duty of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he says, yatlu alayhim ayatihi. That the first duty of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is to recite the what? The book. So a person is able to learn the book and recite it. Secondly, in that same ayah, Allah tells the Prophet and he speaks to the people that this Prophet, he will teach them the book. So when he teaches the book, people will learn the book. And out of that ta'aleem and ta'allum, a person will gain ilm and knowledge. So he has that. So a person will learn the book and he has ilm and knowledge. And then Allah says, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ And he teaches them al-hikmah, wisdom. And according to all the commentators of the Holy Quran, they have stated that whenever the word, the word al-hikmah is used in the Quran, and it comes immediately after the word al-kitab, which is the Quran, hikmah refers to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So here a person may look at these things, after acquiring the knowledge of these things, he may consider himself to have sufficient knowledge. Anybody, a person will say, I know how to read the Quran, I know the meaning and message of the Quran, and I know the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, a person who has that, which, 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 which comprises of the, the three things which Allah has mentioned, he will say, I'm a scholar, I'm an alim, I have ilm. Allah says, that is not enough. That is not enough. You can read the Quran, that is good. You have the knowledge, that is good. You have the knowledge of the Sunnah and the book, Alhamdulillah. But Allah says to the Prophet, those three things cannot be sufficient. There must be a fourth thing. It cannot be sufficient for the hidayat and the guidance of people and what is needed, which is the second duty which the Prophet wasallam was commissioned by Allah to do, where he says, Wa yuzakihim, and he purifies them. He purifies their heart. He cleanses their heart from all the diseases and the vices and the sickness that lies in the heart. That is a job. So therefore, it tells us that if we need to walk on this path of guidance which was brought by the Prophet ﷺ, if we need to have what is called Islam as sent by Allah, which is the Islam comprising these four duties of the Prophet wasallam, then we cannot suffice ourselves with reading the Quran, 
with learning the knowledge, knowing about the sunnah, and consider that sufficient. We cannot suffice ourselves, but a very, very important thing is equally needed, and that is the cleanliness of the heart and the purity of the heart, which is called islah nafs or taskiyatun nafs. That's very, very important. And we highlighted last week that there are many diseases and there are sicknesses that corrupts the heart. And great scholars have written volumes on these things. Imam Ghazali has written books on the diseases and the sicknesses of the heart. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and great scholars have mentioned about it. What are those things that can corrupt the heart? You and I know very well that if there is some bacteria that comes onto the body, some germ enters onto a wound or something, it can make the, the, the part of the body, it can make it sick, it will make it handicapped in the sense that it can't move before. You have to go for surgery on that particular part of the body, etc., etc. So we see that when there is a sickness attacking the external part of the body, it leads to damage. Similarly, when there is a sickness attacking the internal part of the body, there is even a more serious damage. And what must be stored in the heart it is more important than that which can be displayed by the actions outside. Why? If a person is seen to be doing all the actions that a Muslim is required to do, he performs salat five times a day. Nay, he may come to the masjid five times a day. He recites the Quran. He gives zakat and he fasts in the month of Ramadan. But with all of these things, he has no iman in his heart. He's not a Muslim. He's absolutely no Muslim and no believer at all in the sight of Allah. But Allah alone knows the heart. We can't say that. So he has all the external actions. He's doing everything. Everybody takes him to be a Muslim. Everybody takes him to be a good Muslim, a good brother. But if that heart doesn't have Iman in it, he's no Muslim. He's an unbeliever in the sight of Allah. Let's put it the opposite. What about if a person has Iman in the heart? He believes in Allah. He submits to Allah from the depths of his heart. But out of his weakness, and out of the lack of the strength of Iman, he is not able to perform Salat. He is not able to fast. He is not given Zakat, etc. He will be called a Fasik, a transgressor. But he will never be called a Kafir. He is a Muslim. He is a believer. Why? Because he has it in his heart. So Allah looks at what the heart has in it. The body is filled with so many good actions, but if the heart is empty, he's nothing in the sight of Allah. And the body can be free from all those beautiful actions, but the heart has a man. He's a believer in the sight of Allah. Allah will punish him. That is Allah's choice for whatever sins he may have committed. But inshallah, one day, on account of the iman he has in his heart, he will go to Jannat and stay there forever and ever. So it is mu'tabar and considered what is in the heart. So therefore, that part of it is very important. There have been great ulamas by the thousands who actually made the maqsad of their life. The maqsad of their life was actually trying to preach taskiyah to nufus. The maqsar of their life was cleansing the internal, ensuring that our hearts are clean and our hearts are pure, and teaching others to do that. And from among those diseases and sickness that the scholars have mentioned about it, is that which is called hasad. There are many. But let's take one, which is called hasad. It's a very, very destructive vice and disease of the heart, hasad. Hasad, which is normally translated as envy and jealousy, hasad. It is a very, very destructive vice, an evil that enters the heart. And when it occupies the heart of a person, it brings about discontentment. It brings about dissatisfaction. It brings about selfish attitude. It brings about a disgruntled attitude. A person is never satisfied. A person is never contented what with whatever he has or she has or with another what another person has. He becomes selfish. And that hasad and envy or jealousy that's, that is in the heart 
It leads the person to now speak ill of others. It leads the person to actually backbite and slander other people. This is, this is what is in the heart and it starts to come out in different, in different ways. So that is a disease that corrupts the heart. And it takes such a position in the heart that it begins to control the organs of the body. What the tongue says is what the heart is the command which comes from the heart because the heart is the king of the body. All the limbs and the organs of the body take their ruling from the heart. It controls them. The thoughts are processed and it goes out. And these things are either obedient or they are not obedient. And when we look at the Quran and we look at in what ways the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hadith and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Holy Quran has mentioned to us about it. From these things we can see how destructive this thing may be and how destructive, destructive it is in reality that which is called Hassan. So much so that Allah tells us and He commands us in the Holy Quran that this is such a dangerous thing and destructive evil that you as believers you are commanded to beg Allah to protect you from the envy and the envy of the envious ones. That's a law in the Quran. Allah tells us to do that because He knows what it is about. And in that last, second to last surah of the Holy Quran, Allah tells and what Allah reveals in Surah Al-Falaq, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the daybreak or the Lord of the dawn. مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ And I seek refuge in all the evils that Allah has created. It goes on to say, and I seek refuge with Allah from the darkness that covers the land. And I seek refuge in Allah from the witchcraft as they do their witchcraft and they blow on the nuts. Actions of witchcraft and sorcery that people normally do. They, they, they take something belonging to you and they say what they have to say. They blow it on you and then a lot of evil comes on account of that. And then lastly, Allah says to the Prophet, Qul and say to the people, the believers, that you are seeking refuge من شر حاسدين إذا حسد from the evils of the envious ones when they practice envy. From the envy of the envious ones or the envious ones, you are seeking refuge with Allah to protect you from every single one of the makhluk, whether they be from the among men or jinn. When they practice their envy, Oh Allah, I ask for your protection to protect me and defend me from what? Because any time an evil of that nature is practiced, it brings about many other evils. It brings about many other evils. When a person has envy in his heart, and when he has hatred in his heart, and he has animosity in his heart for any person, he does not allow it to remain within the confines of his heart. But what he does, he tries to infiltrate that same thing into the minds of other people. He tries to infiltrate that same thing in the hearts of other people. So he does not allow it to remain within the confines of his heart. That is how he thinks. But he will say somebody, look at that person there. He will pick out the fault of that person, reveal it to another one. Look what he is doing. So therefore, it leads towards many other evils. And this thing is so dangerous that Allah is commanding us. Oh my believers, you beg me to protect you from these sort of people and this type of disease which is called hasad. Because you can't protect your own self. That is so dangerous. You can't protect yourself from it. How can we protect ourselves from it? How can we go and tell a person, don't do that? No. Allah says, you can't do it. Because it is such a dangerous thing. It's such a dangerous thing that the Hasid and the envious ones, he doesn't want anything good to come to anybody. That is why it's so dangerous. A Hasid, one who has Hasid, the envious one and the jealous one, he wants 
that no good should come to anyone and this brings us to the definition of the word hasad there are two types of hasad and both are totally unlawful and haram in Islam one the basis of hasad the meaning of hasad it's where a person he wants in his heart that the favor which came to another person he shouldn't have that at all why does this man have that why he's like this why should he have that thing? That is in the heart. Tamanni zawalu ni'mat an ghayrihi. It is the, the desire and the wish in the heart of a person that a favor from Allah should not remain with a person. Now, that desire that the favor should not remain with a person, it may come in a way where you are not really bothered whether you get that or not. One way is that, for example, your next door neighbor has a good job. Alhamdulillah, that brings a good income. You not like that. So one thing is that you are asking, why should he be living so good and happy? Why should he have such a good job? Why he has so many good things in life? He's seen his way and everything is going good. And in my home, there is always a quarrel and there is always a dispute and there is always a fight. Look, how, why should he be like that? And it is not that you wanted to leave him and come to you. It's just that you just don't want him to have it. That's a hazard. That's a hazard which is the most dangerous hazard. Totally haram. And the other type of hazard is where you want it to leave him so that you will get it. Why is he having everything? I want some also. He shouldn't have anything. I should have everything. So therefore, when that tendency develops in the heart of a person, how can that person be satisfied? Now, that person will never be satisfied in his life. And when he's not satisfied in his life, he will never thank Allah for whatever he has. He will always look at somebody and say, I'm supposed to get that. Why does the person have? And when he is not even thanking Allah for the small he has, he does not even have that goodness in his heart to ever give priority to another person above himself. He becomes selfish. Because he wants everything that a person has. He wants everything. So everything that he gets, rather than passing it over, he says, no, I shall have it. And if a person comes with something, and there, is, there are two people in front of him and he says, I have this gift to give. I want to know who I should give it to. Then normally a person will look at another one who, is my, who might be in unfortunate circumstances, who might be having a difficult life, who may be poor and needy. And you may say, give it to the brother. Give it to him, mashallah. You know, it will be good for him. But if a person has envy, he wouldn't even say that. He said, give it to me. Because he's never satisfied and pleased. So these are the two types of hasad. One is that you want a person wishes that whatever goodness a person has, he shouldn't have that at all. It should come to me. Or the other one is that he shouldn't have it whether or not you get it. Both are totally haram and unlawful. And hasad, it comes about on account of three things that the scholars have mentioned. Why would you envy a person? Because he is a man? Well, you are a man also. Because he's young, you are young also. Because he has life, you have life also. Because he has Iman, you also have Iman. So why would you envy? Envy comes about on account of three things. Mal, wealth, ilm, knowledge or status. A person envies another one because that person has wealth. That person is prosperous in life. He has a supermarket and he's doing well. You have a supermarket, you're not doing well. Envy comes about. Why he should get all the sales? Why he should get all the, the customers? Why? Then when that thought starts to come in the mind and in the heart, why he's having so many and he's having so much, the other thought that comes about, can we do something to stop that? Subhanallah. See how Satan plays with the mind now. Can we do something to stop that? Satan will say, yes, you can do something. Try to deter the people from going, him, going to him. 
So if the person doesn't have any fault, what you will do, you will make up a fault about that person. And whenever fault comes in your head and in your mind, you will try to put that in the hearts of other people. And we can see the effects of that. That sometime, let's look at three people. A, B, and C. Between A and B, there might be a little conflict. So B probably may have done something wrong to A. But B didn't do anything wrong to C. Isn't that so? So A may have a right to become angry with B because they had a little conflict between themselves. But what we see in our communities is that rather than A alone becoming angry, C is becoming angry, D is becoming angry, until Z has become angry. Why? What did B do then? That's the question. They never had a confrontation with Mr. B, isn't that so? In fact, he treats them well. He has not done, done them any harm. But why are they angry with him? It's so because of that which comes in the heart of A, he wants to pass it on to everybody. And Satan comes. He's not speaking to me. I'll get everybody to behave just as I am behaving. Satan comes in there now. And he infiltrates the mind. Whereas that conflict was confined only to between B and A and B. So therefore, it occurs in wealth. Even among family members. Sometimes family members do not like to see other family members prosper. There is a big thing that goes on among family members. Which school your child is going to and which school my child is going to and how many, you know, how, ma how ma much passes your child came out with and how much passes my child came up with and which school he's going to attend at which school. And there is a big thing. And most of this competition that goes on sometimes among family members, it's all based on envy and jealousy and nothing else. And nothing else. So sometimes because of the fact that is based on envy. Sometimes people become happy when others fail in life. And we have a lot of that. When we hear a man has fallen sick, some people here, you hear them saying it's good for him. When someone has lost his job, it's good for him. When something has happened to someone, it's good for him. It goes to show that everything we were doing was based on envy and jealousy. And we really didn't like anybody to rise above us. That's the first thing. Envy and jealousy out of wealth. Have a lot of that. In the past and present. So, the other type, or the other thing that envy comes about for, is that of ilm and knowledge. A person happens to know better than you. He knows more than you. Rather than confine it to being a scholar, it's, it can simply be based on people, some people have more knowledge than others. But there are individuals who, don't, who just can't digest that. Why should this person know more than me? I'm supposed to know more. Why are people going to him, they're supposed to come to me? A person becomes a scholar, so he becomes a leader. People listen to him. People take things from him. People want to learn from him. People love him. People respect him. But that envy that comes in the heart, it makes one discontented. And it makes one uneasy. Why? Why all this is happening? Why is this happening? And why is that happening? Why? Because of envy. Not that something is wrong with that individual, or not that something is wrong with other individuals, but because of the satanic vice that is in the heart of an individual. These things start to come on the tongue. It starts to come in, in on the heart. Why he should be like this? Or why she should be like this? And why this is so? And why this is so? And the other one is that of status. Somebody happens to become a, a leader in the community. Somebody happens to get the highest office. Somebody happens to become the CEO of a new company. Or the person who was a simple manager, he becomes the general manager now. He might be a family member. <laughs> we become envious of that. Now, Zabila. He might be a close friend from the day, but from the day he assumes that position, we don't get along good with him. But he was always our friend. So all of these three things, but what we should know as Muslims is that all favors, they come from Allah alone and nobody else. Whether the favor is of wealth, that is only from Allah. 
whether it is out of knowledge that is only from Allah and whether it is out of status and position in a community or a country that comes only on account of Allah so when people did that in the past at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah revealed an ayat saying to them Am yahsudun an nasa bima atahum Allah min fadli Are you envious of people on account what Allah has given to them out of his own grace? Why? This is why Allah is saying that this envy and jealousy is so destructive you need to ask Allah for constant protection against the envious one because an envious person he argues and fights with Allah an envious person objects to Allah's decree because when Allah has chosen to make a man prosperous what is the envious one doing asking why should he be given that but it is Allah's decision to give him that that is why he has it isn't that so Allah has already made his decree that this individual I will bless him with prosperity so he is blessed with prosperity but the envious now have a problem the envious ones have a problem with what Allah has done so they are actually opposing Allah's decree they are rejecting Allah rejecting Allah's decree they are fighting with Allah oh Allah why did you do that to that person you should have given me instead not him that is fighting the decree of Allah and anyone who fights against Allah and objects to Allah's decree Allah wages war with that person so this is why you will never see an envious person peaceful in life. You will never see that. You will never see a, an envious person continuously happy because what is in his heart shows on his face. Whatever is in the heart, this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Wajhu Mir'atul Qalb The face is a mirror of the heart. And probably we don't know, but what we have in our face people there are people who are able to identify the mischief that we have in our hearts sometimes the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sit down as soon as a person comes in he will tell the companions his face shows that he comes with good leave him let him come sometimes he will say that face bears the sign of wickedness stop him right there he has mischief this is why it is on account of this the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says اِتَّقُوا عَنْ فِرَاسَةِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّهُ يَنْظُرُ بِنُورِ اللَّهِ Beware of the insight of a believer for he sees with the light of Allah. Allah gives him that insight so through that insight he may, able to, he may be able to protect himself from worldly harms. Sometimes you are about to do something and there is a, just a thought that comes in the mind don't do it and you walk away from it. And the walking away from it afterwards you realize was good for you. That's guidance from Allah. That is the nur and the, the firasa that Allah has given. So Allah asked the question, Am nasa bima atahum Allah min Are you people envying other people? Are you jealous of other people on account of the favors that Allah has chosen to give to them? Then you are opposing the decree of Allah. How can you ever be contented with whatever Allah has given to you? So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us against it and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned to us, beware of it. Because sometimes we want to do a lot of good and on account of those things that we bring in our heart, it destroys every good thing we have done. Imam Abu Dawood has recorded the tradition in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Iyaka wal hasada, beware of envy and jealousy. Beware of envy and jealousy. Why? فَإِنَّ الْحَسَدَ يَأْكُلُ الْحَسَنَاتِ For certainly, hasad and envy, it eats up your good deeds. It destroys your good deeds. Like what? كَمَا تَأْكُلُ النَّارُ الْحَطَبُ وَالْعُشُبُ Just as fire will destroy the sticks and the grass. So you have so many pieces of stick here that you have guarded for some project and let a fire reach onto it and see what happens to that just as us we gather so many good deeds by five times salat a day by doing this and doing that and once we bring that it will just begin to eat and destroy leaving us with nothing so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam has warned us has warned us and sometimes it is in the heart and it becomes apparent on the tongue based on what we hear 
In other words, the question can be asked, well, if hasad is a sickness and a disease of the heart, how would you know that that is in the heart of a person? It's simple to hear the tongue speak. Hear the criticism and the condemnation and hear the remarks. It's simple. And Allah gives us an example of that. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a beautiful ayah. You know when the Sahaba started to accept Islam, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people started to tell them all kind of things. People started to, to, to prevent them. What are you doing? Why are you listening to this man? Why are you listening to this man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Do not listen to him. He is mad. He is insane. He doesn't know what he is saying. If you people accept Islam, you're going to lose all your wealth because then you will be outcast from the city. You will have to run away to your close by city, Medina, and leave all your wealth there. So do not listen to him at all. Now, when we look at these remarks, a person can say, well, probably the man means well because really if I, I, I listen to Muhammad, I may have to leave everything. So a person in an individual basis may say, well, probably they mean well, they mean well. But Allah opens up the eyes of the believers. He opens up the eyes of the believers. And He opens up the eyes of every single one. Do not become blinded. And do not become, let's say, do not become innocent. To the extent that everything you hear, you just believe it one. And you think that the intention the person told you is actually the intention of what he said. You have to be conscious. You have to look. You have to look at the things that are there. So, about that same action, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّوكُمْ مِّنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا Many of the people of the book, many of the people of the book from among the Jews and the Christians, they will wish that they will turn you back as unbelievers after you have become believers. So they will say, this is a no good religion. They will say, this is a religion that requires you to go and give your life and leave your family and your wife over there. This is a religion that is commanding you to give zakat. What type of religion is this? This religion is telling you to fast, leave your food and drink. So all these statements are being made. What is the truth of these statements? Why were these people making it? Did they mean any good? Allah says no. What the kathirun min ahl al kitabi. لَوْ يَرُدُّكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِكُمْ إِمْ كُفَّارًا Many of the people of the book, they would wish that they could carry you back as unbelievers after you have accepted Iman. Why? Allah says, حَسَدًا مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ Out of envy and jealousy, subhanAllah. So you are hearing words on one side, you would want to believe that they mean good. Allah says, no, 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 no. Don't be carried away with those sweet words. It is on account of their envy and their jealousy they have. Hasadam min anfusihim on account of the envy and jealousy they have in their hearts against you. Because they don't want any good to come to you. They haven't accepted it, so they don't want you to accept it also. And this occurred after the truth has come. After the truth has come. So therefore, what do you do with such people? They are always doing something. They are always saying something. They are saying, you are nobody. You people who accepted Muhammad, look at you. You have no wealth. You are weak. You are feeble. You are the insignificant ones of the community. Allah commands the Muslims and the believers. And, uh, 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 you know, it's a teaching for all of us. Fa'afu asfahu. Oh, believers, you just forgive what they are doing. And you overlook. Because what can you really do? You have to maintain cleanliness in your hearts. So if they hate you, you don't hate them. If they backbite you, you don't backbite them. If they taunt you, you don't do it. And you should adopt the trait of the son of Adam. You know when Cain told Abel, I'm going to kill you. Allah mentions in the Quran. When Cain told Abel, I'm going to kill you. Qabil told Habil. What did the brother say? Subhanallah. The brother said, listen, if you want to stain your hand with blood and commit murder, I am not going to do that. On the day of judgment, you will be the murderer, not me. So if you want to do evil, I am not going to repay an evil with an evil. I am not going to do evil. Because if I do, I will suffer just like you. So you do it, Allah is our judge. And he did it, and he killed him. So therefore, 
Allah is telling us in the Quran, you don't repair an evil with an evil, so this is what they do, let it be like that, so they alone will have to render an account to Allah, not you. Fa'afu, so forgive. Wasfahu, and overlook. Until what time? Hatta yati Allahu bi amri. Until Allah brings his decision. Allah will certainly do something. Allah loves justice and Allah will deal with every situation. Why? Because in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, Allah is all powerful over every single thing. So therefore, we live in situations like that also. So two important lessons for myself and all of us here is that the, the teaching of the Holy Quran is that we must try to ensure that we have clean hearts. We must try to purify our hearts and always maintain, if people have things against us, let them be like that. If people want to dirty their hearts, let them do it. If they want to corrupt their hearts, let them do it. But we as intelligent people should not corrupt our hearts. Because we are accountable to Allah. We should live with clean hearts, die as clean hearts, so that we will be resurrected as clean people with clean hearts and pure believers. We shouldn't do that. A man does wrong, that's between him and Allah. Let's turn to Allah and always maintain that. And the other thing is that when we do hear others, it happens, as I said, in, within the family circle, all over the place, people are taunting us and saying so many things. You leave them to Allah. You don't have to take any action. Inshallah, Allah will give you your satisfaction. And Allah is the best of all judges. And Allah is the best person who can protect. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. May Allah protect us. And may Allah give us clean and pure hearts. Wal-akhir da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.